So that is more um, talk on a social um, on a social level. It's about the hype tech menace, or is security an obstacle for large scale projects and especially for e government? Um, in theory, a system is typically practically invulnerable, but in practice, it should theoretically have been invulnerable. So, in 2003, a customer gave me a mandate to investigate an e-health application which was in real use with real patients. And it had some security claims which I was to verify. And there were some very strong security assertions. Official approvals by data, uh, privacy, uh, data protection officers. There was an academic, that is a theoretical security review. They were using highly certified smart cards and um, they had been approved by the ministry for usage with real patient, patients. And um, what was fun about this, I had only four days time, working time. Honestly, I said to my customer, don't expect anything, not in this time, not against this system. Um, I proved to be very wrong with this prognosis. I can't give you the complete um, analyze. It takes uh, well above an hour to demonstrate this. Just a few highlights, highlights which are, I think, of very general interest. Um, this is a sketch of the system. You have the, prax um, the practitioner's computer system over there, and there are some medical data is sitting and it's um, communicated between medical doctors by this system. And it works essentially like this. The data is first sealed and encrypted. Then there is a second level of encryption for transport. This transport encryption is strip stripped off at the central server. And the next medical doctor is fetching the data from there and all is controlled by the patient, and the patient, patient is the only one carrying the key which can open the inner crypto envelope. I think the, um, the colors are quite, quite clear in this picture. So this looks like a very, very strong system. And what I did was, uh, I let the system run with several hundred thousand transactions and noted the red keys, the IDs which are served here, these ones, yeah, these keys. Um, I did a large collection and then I tabulated this collection against the time. I calculated a time correlation. So if you are looking at keys, of course you are expecting that keys are very random. We perhaps have quite different um, ideas of quality of random, but I think we can agree that is, that is not looking very random. So I've chosen a different correlation approach. Now I correlated consecutive keys. And it looks like this, and if you look very precisely, then you see there are three red lines. One going horizontal, one vertical, and one diagonal. And actually these two correlations enabled to reconstruct the algorithm how the keys were chosen. Yeah. But there were more observations. They were using the smart cards. And Normally, smart cards are quite secure. You can perhaps uh, attack a smart card, but typically it's hardened even against laboratory attacks. But in this system, after the software started, you could remove the smart card and the system was still functioning. 
that is very, very surprising because then the smart card cannot do the encryption. And that means that the key is not stored in the crypto module of the smart card, but elsewhere and must be transported to the computer system. And actually, when I eavesdropped on the serial line, to my great surprise and um, to the joy of the darker of my two halves, um, actually, I've got a private key. So with um, these two results, the key generation, depending on the clock of the client, as you remember from the correlation diagrams, the algorithm and the fact that we have a timestamp on the server. Whenever a transaction is done, it's locked on the server, so we have a timestamp, and this timestamp typically is within very few seconds of the client clocks. So we can, in this system, we can do anything what we want. We can decrypt the patient data, for example, if we are owner of the central server. That was one of the security claims, that that is not possible. And actually worse, we would have been in the position to fake the signatures of the medical doctors. That is, we would have been in the position to fake medical health records, which is very, very bad news. Okay, so what can we learn from this on a more general um, term? The first problem is if you find something like this, you have no chance to know if the persons doing this were simple stupid or if they purposely placed a crypto backdoor. The next thing that we can learn, whatever security assertions you are given, first look what the security assertions are really saying and then verify if they are valid. In this case, they were all not valid. Yeah, what we also can learn, even if a system is composed of a lot of strong components, we had a smart card, we had top grade crypto algorithms. Actually, we had a lot of good components, but the de design was flawed. And for that reason, all these components failed. That's very similar to buying a um, burglar protected door and bolting it into a paper wall. Yeah? The burglar protecting door is strong, but it doesn't help you because the first kick against the door will break the wall. Yeah? And finally, even if uh, you have a sound design, it can be implemented flawed. And so, we see theory is theory and practice and is practice, and in practice, it's very recommendable to do a practical security review because the theoretical security review didn't find any of this. Yes, next part of the talk. What is the difference between terrorists and IT security experts? Anyone? Trying an answer? Terrorist Ah, you know it. <laughs> yeah? Terrorists do have sympathizers, at least outside their own ranks. I want to give you a short um, summary of the reception of this result, which was an ordered penetration test. Yeah? So, in January 2004, I delivered the results to my customer. This customer escalated the results, I don't know the exact date, but in spring 2004, escalated the results to the manufacturer. Nothing happened. Okay, in December 2004, I gave this uh, examples um, as an example for a talk about security testing. After that, help break close. First, I got uh, this mail from a professor who was not attending the talk, who was not knowing about what I was talking. 
And he essentially said, your talk damaged what we have tried to build up in the last years. Um, surprise, my talk damaged? I did not program this crap. <laughs> Sorry, yeah? And then, actually, what happened was, and I can prove this, there it happened a lot of things I can't prove, yeah? at least not in court. But these are things I can prove in court. There was active disinformation about my person to the media. There was active disinformation about the content of my talk to the media. There were, just per coincidence, major changes to the target of investigation after the talk, not before, after the talk. And the Fraunhofer Society, which somehow, I can't tell why, um, meant that I have analyzed a system of um, the Fraunhofer Society, tried really to muzzle me judically. No, no, not with money. I was, I was invited. I was invited for a talk, and uh, they sent me a fax, a facsimile, and this facsimile was timed such that I could not get it before the talk, and um, it uh, threatened me with um, <laughs> substantial um, Schadensersatz um, lit litigation with substantial litigation if I should ever repeat this talk. And they did this a few hours before the next talk, and they sent the project leader to this talk as an expert um, witness. Yeah? Nice try. The point is they would, ha they would have needed to prove that anything is wrong. And I offered them to do this, inside or outside court, and they didn't... Uh, took the challenge. Okay, so the conclusions is it's very important to make very clear to the general public security experts are reporting problems. We are not creating them and we are not the problems. Yeah? That's one thing. The second thing that we can learn and um, we'll see that in more detail later when a manufacturer is avoiding critical discussion of security issues, then they make security a question of face. It's not a question of um, technology which could be proved, validated or falsified. It's becoming a question of face. And when you have face, you have superstition. So once you have superstition, no matter what you prove about the security of your systems, you won't be believed anymore. Huh? Um, yeah, and that is, this leads finally to a really um, big problem. Think of the Zeppelin Hindenburg. When Hindenburg crashed in Lakehurst, that marked for around 60 to 70 years the end of the technology. At the time, Hindenburg, the Zeppelin Hindenburg crashed, um, helium as gas to fill Zeppelins just became available. Though so there was a technology that this could not have happened anymore in the future, but the technology was not getting a second chance. And that is something very important we have to keep in mind. If we had a really major incident with e-health systems that can shatter public confidence in IT security in general, that can damage much, much more than, than just e-health. And I think that is very important for everybody to realize. Yeah? Because personally, I'm doing... Um, computers since 28 years, and I love this very much, and I would prefer to do it, let's say, two decades longer, but um, if we are failing in areas like this, we have good chances that um, the computer use will change massively. Okay, the next part.
So the whole e-health area is a good example for a lot of um, aspects you find in large-scale projects and especially in e-government proje projects. And this has not much to do with reality. Um, I did, after the talk 2004, I did make a big mistake. Um, I wanted to soothe my nerves and others. Everybody was claiming the result you presented is relevant for the big German e-health project, which is called Gesundheitstelematik. Everybody was claiming this, journalists, um, other people. And I wanted to soothe myself and them by reading this and then after the, the documents of the project, and then after that being able to say, calm down, what I found has nothing to do with this big project. <clears throat> that was a very, very stupid idea. And led to the next talk in 2005. Um, actually, the, the problem shifted a little bit. So one thing, for example, is the economic aspects of this project. Yeah? We have a wide range of claims, what the benefits and what the costs is. And um, if you see how far the data from the Ministry of Health differs from an official cost-benefit analysis, which was never meant to be published, but uh, somehow leaked out of um, the customer, then you see we are talking about a lot of money and we are talking a lot of politics. Because it's always claimed after 10 years the Gesundheitstelematik would have an amortization. But if you look at the numbers, then the estimate is 14 billion, billion euro benefit after 10 years, 13.5 billion euro costs after 10 years, and by explicit requests of the customer of the cost-benefit analysis, 0 0.6 billion euro had not to be calculated into the costs. You can do the math yourself, yeah? So we see there is um, a lot of politics in this project. And actually, if we look at numbers we have from the British and the US, then we can expect costs of uh, 570 euro per head, per citizen. And for Germany, this would make roughly 47 billion euros. And this is a lot of money. And that in a, in a project where there's not much public discussion and control. Then in, uh, we have a lot of practic practical and medical aspects. We have countless uh, usability issues. For example, the systems um, more or less require a young uh, technophile user that is not uh, the typical patient. Yeah. Um, it's even worse. There is no, um, there's no accessibility planned, for example, for blind or visually handicapped persons in the health system for handling and controlling their own data. Yeah? It's not uh, the medical doctor handling the data. We have a lot of things in the system where the patient would be required to do decisions with his own, own data, and there is no access for the visually impaired. No, none. Then there's a lot of um, acceptance marketing in the general public, and this acceptance marketing is massively flawed. It's medically flawed. For example, there's always a the claim that blood type is emergency data, and that is simply nonsense. No doctor will ever do a transfusion of blood based on a blood type he finds in some data you carry with you. 
Uh, one doctor said this very drastically. Even if your blood type is tattooed on your forehead, I'm not interested. I will do my own test for very, very good reasons. Yeah. And it's completely ridiculous if a medical lineman like me can discover such fallacies in a project. And finally, after the talk in 2005, this information vanished from all the public websites. You can prove this, for example, with the Internet Archive machine. Yeah? And there are much, much more problems like this, and this culminated um, in um, May of this year with the congregation of the German Medical Association stating publicly there is no evident medical benefit in this system. Now we are talking about an investment in billions, tens of billions of euro within 10 years, and there is no evident medical benefit. And then, of course, we have a lot of security and privacy aspects. Again, with the pin handling, we have numerous usability issues. And um, what is really um, uncomforting is there is mandatory data and optional data. And it's always claimed the patient can decide for all critical data if he will entrust this data to the system. But it's simply not true. He is forced to give um, detailed identification data and he is forced to give his prescription data to the system. And with the prescription data, you can reconstruct the diagnosis. Simple example, if somebody is prescribed insulin, what could be his sickness? It's, of course, diabetes. Yeah? And the same relation holds for many, many more med uh, medicaments if you are a medical expert. Yeah? And um, from this data, actually, that is written in the laws, from this data, a morbidity ranking of the patients is done. Uh, you are a good um, or a bad health risk, which would be extremely interesting for the insurance companies or even for the employers, for example. Uh, and then, um, what is really discomforting is in the official requirements and some official statements there are some indicators that there are crypto backdoors. So, for example, one specialist for um, inner security is saying that um, if it should help the fight against terror, then of course the data, the medical data in this system would be used. But that is only possible if you have a crypto backdoor, because otherwise you can't get at this data. Um, there are more reasons to believe that there is a crypto backdoor, and that perhaps can give an answer to the question for the first system I presented. It was a precursor of uh, this Gesundheitstelematik. And because of this, I really came to believe that it might indeed have been a crypto backdoor, which was put in there by purpose because it just fits so well with the, all the other data. But what are the conclusions? Uh, perhaps a little bit more. This project is severely getting out of hand. By law, the latest date to introduce the system, system to full operations was the 1st January of 2006. Now they plan a rollout on 1st of April, yeah, full stay, um, 2008, and the fun thing about this is they will release a release zero. And this release zero has, as the name same, says, zero functionality of what was originally planned. Yeah? It's a complete mock up. And I was in a very <laughs> eerie workshop recently, a workshop where of one of the model regions where the system is tested in the field, 
The test results were discussed. And first, the technical project leader spoke. Everything is working wonderful, brilliantly, no problems. Okay, now I know a little bit about technology and I know a little bit about real problems in tests and actually about this tests too. And I asked him, how many, what is your failure rate when reading in the smart cards? The failure rate is around 4%. four percent. Um, when the cards are working in one model region, they had to uh, scratch 70% of the cards just after issuing. Yeah. But when they are working, the failure rate is around 4%. And he said, no, we have no failures in reading the cards. After him, three medical doctors spoke, which were actually doing the tests. And they were reporting numerous prob problems, and of course, they had a lot of reading failures. And I think if I not have known for sure they were talking about the same test, I would have suspected they are talking about two completely different things. Yeah? And based on these reports, of, on these technical reports, political decisions are made. And what now is happening after several years of announcement that this project will issue soon and will be operative soon, public faith is wavering. Faith and patience is wavering. And you remember, I said, if you, if you um, avoid the technical discussion, you make things a question of faith. And that is just starting here. And security is also strongly becoming a question of faith here. And I personally expect that whatever they do now in this project, they will not get rid of the bad faith in the system, which is just coming now. So we will have goodwill losses. Goodwill losses is a typical uh, damage we uh, normally have with um, security incidents. We will have goodwill losses here, and I personally feel that this goodwill losses will encompass much more than just this system. That is my personal fear. And one more thing. If I give trainings, security trainings, which I occasionally do, um, then I always say, you, you can be quite sure that somebody is trying a social engineering attack against you when you feel that several of these senses of these emotions are provoked by your communication partner. Yeah? If he is trying to provoke the sense of an opportunity or of urgency, or that you will have a loss, yeah? or that he is something, that he is an authority who is not to be questions, questioned. Things like this. And all this leads to, and therefore secu uh, security considerations are secondary. A further indicator for social engineering attack is to try to isolate, uh, to isolate you from uh, asking another person to get an independent view. Yeah? If several of these factors come together, normally you can be quite sure you have a social engineering attack. And now we have a look at the claims for the introduction of e-health, and these are the same practically all over the world. E-health will bring tremendous health savings. And we have to urge, we have to hurry to have the first working e-health solution because otherwise the others will make the business. You need e-health because if you don't have e-health, the medical doctor in an emergency will not know your blood type. That is actually communicated publicly. We have the data protection officer approval for this system. Anyhow, even if you criticize this system, 
nothing will change because the introduction of the system is required by law. And if we not do it, this, we will be left behind. We are not innovative anymore. And our project is the biggest globally. That is true for the German project, and that is at least true for the British project. They are both the biggest IT projects globally. At the same time, both. Fascinating, isn't it? And finally, you are simply not fit to decide, because this is absolutely high-tech, uh, high sorry. Yeah? And there are millions of pages publicly avail available. Do you have read all the pages? Before that, you can't um, offer a public opinion about the system. So I leave it to you if you see any signs of a social engineering attack here. Again, because it's so important, eHealth is so important, security considerations are secondary. We should not um, linger with these projects and um, wait longer for the benefits just because a few security questions are not cleared finally. So my hypothesis on this would be we have an ISO OSI layer 10 attack here. Yeah? We have projects, that's true for many e-government projects and for many public-private partnership projects. Yeah? The projects are set up on a political layer. The public review and control requires very sk rare skill sets these skill sets are mostly controlled by the industry because most people carrying the skills are working there. And if there's an independent expert voicing his critics, then it is tried to suppress this person. And finally, and that is the result, billions of euros or whatever currency you choose in a different uh, area, is wasted in this beacon project. And I could have easily given a very, very long list, list of um, beacon projects failed or significantly, significantly underperforming. The question is, what is the return on investment of these beacon projects for the society? What do you think is skyrocketing here? because this curve seems to um, falsify my claims. What is growing to the sky here? Any idea? Yeah. Hmm? Level 10 religion, I don't know. Child poverty in Germany. That's the growth rate of child poverty in Germany. Pardon? Child poverty, Kinderarmut. In this 70% um, child poverty that correlates to 2.5 million children which are living on the level of social support. Remember, this project will at least cost around 14 billion euro within 10 years probably it will cost 47 billion euros within 10 years. My personal opinion, that's scandalous. So the question is, when we have the experience that many of these large-scale public-private partnership projects fail or underperform, why don't we invest our public money into the future of our society. And the question is, is the future of our society performing beacon projects, or is the future of our society educating a lot of children to the level that they can become experts? Not necessary computer science expert, yeah? just experts, technicians, scientists. And from experience, I have um, 
um, done a lot of work in a social area with um, young adults. Um, from experience, I would guess that well above 80 to 90 percent of children, given a chance, will be successful in their lives and will benefit society. And if we look at Beacon projects, we see that 80 to 90 percent fail or at least significantly underperform. That's one important point I think we have to keep in mind. The second is when we want to live in a democracy, we need stringent control, independent control of Beacon projects. And we should take it as an indicator of danger for our society if um, critics are suppressed. Because that is, somebody is trying to manipulate our perception of reality. And that is a social engineering attack. And finally, we have to keep in mind the, tech, uh, the systems we build might be misused against society as a whole later. So we have to build systems resilient against total, total, totalitarian misuse. I want to give you one example, the Holocaust. During the Second World War, the computer science had two large effects. One was a good one, that was breaking the enigma with Colossus in, um, uh, what's the name? Um, Bletchley uh, Park, exactly. Um, and the second was the Holocaust was organized and was efficient because of the use of Hollerit cards, uh, punch cards. The census in 1933 and 1939 was done with punch cards and with help of the punch cards, a very small circle of people was in the position to very quickly and efficiently generate lists of Jews, for example, and prepare the lists for the um, commandos which um, deported these Jews. So that is not to say that Holocaust would not have been possible without information technology, but it was much more deadly and much, much more efficient because the small circle is be better to isolate. You don't have so many information leaks which could warn people. Yeah? And I think we have to keep that in mind when um, designing large-scale public systems, that we have to build them resilient, because especially in the health system, um, we have to keep in mind this information has abuse potential about 150 years. Now, if I know you have um, disease which is congenital, that is a disease which you inherit to your children and to, their, and to their children, then the information that you have this disease is relevant in 150 years because then your children's children perhaps still are trying to get employed or to get insured. And you can correct me, but as far as I know at the time, we don't even have um, encryption technology where I would bet that this would last 150 years. So, I come to the last part. We have in the society a general perception that hacking is harmful. And I want to challenge this. Perhaps you know the old dialogue where this is indirectly quoted from. Um, of course, attacking other people's system is a criminal act. But the main problem is that technology which is not understood and most people have no idea 
what we are talking about this here in this conference, yeah, is seen, is looked upon and um, handled like magic. And magic has always provoked fear in prosecution. Yeah? We can look at all cultures at nearly all times, at least at all times where we have written recordings from. Um, so it's very understandable that hacking is considered harmful. But on the other hand, it's making things too easy because it's just scapegoating um, technical aptness for the failure of manufacturers and owners of systems. And we really have to communicate to the general public if this could be a realistic approach because nobody would access, accept a mass production vehicle on the streets without, without public approval, the so-called homologation. No mass vehicle hits the street before it has been thoroughly tested. And of course, these tests encompass crash testing. There's no car on the street beside old timers which was not crash tested. Yeah. And of course, nobody will prohibit or condemn crash testing activity, even if it's not performed by the manufacturer themselves. And nobody would criminalize the tools or the skills you need to do this. In Germany, we just have uh, new laws which go very strongly in the direction to criminalize the tools you need to do this with computers. And the general public has really to understand that practical security testing is the same for IT what is crash testing for cars. And therefore, it's not harmful. It's absolutely indispensable. And we need the experts. And again, the question is, where should these experts come from? Are you saying that the experts are like crash test dummies? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yes? No, I have very, uh, I mean, the way you present it makes me very uncomfortable, like comparing it back to crash testing. I mean, I can buy a car, it's my car, I can crash test it, no problem. I can buy a Windows glass and, and test it, no problem. But I want, uh, can test uh, this hotel IT system. It's not mine. Yes, of course. You know, the same way I will crash test my neighbor's car. Yep. <laughs> first statement. First statement yeah, to prevent. On the other side of the coin. Yes. You say that uh, hacking in the criminal. No, 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 no. Finding it is a two-side coin, and on one side. No, no, no. Criminal thing, but on the other side, it's good. Let us, let us postpone the content discussion, discussion to the end. It, it's Please. Okay, to the end, but right now it's not... I mean, Just give me a second. Yeah. So, I made it very clear. Hacking is a crime. What I'm talking about is that criminalizing the tools and the skill is a problem. I clearly stated, you should not hack a system which is neither yours or you have a mandate to analyze. But the problem is if you make the skill itself or the tools criminal, you will lose the capability as a society. Yeah? So the characteristic of aspiring technical talents is they want to know how things work. Occasionally, things go a little bit wrong if you are immature, if you are immature as a child. Yeah? Um, so how do we get from a technical talent to an apt technician? He needs theoretical knowledge. He needs practical experience. She needs it too. Um, imagination, creativity, and ideally, responsibility. Some of these things you can achieve with formal education. But to achieve experience and creativity, you need some freedom and you need some opportunity to explore and experiment in a socially acceptable way. 
Yeah? That is, we need a hacking space. A hacking space where you can test your skills without attacking other person's system or other people's system. We need a virtual adventure playground, so to say. Yeah? And of course, we need a free software, in my humble opinion, because that you can look at the code, so this, you can look under the hood. This helps you to understand technology much, much better. Um, yeah. So if we come back to our German health project, where we have this enormous amounts of money, and if we only take the really available official numbers, and the fact that benefit will only come if the system has come to full scope, which will not happen before 2050, then amortization will happen earliest in 2025. And now, the alternative suggestion. Give every 15 million children in Germany, for example, an old PC, a one laptop per child device. You can substitute it every four years, install, let's say, something like 100 or 200 Metalabs in all of Germany, and then still you have several billions of euro left to do something about the sh child poverty of 2.5 million children. And the interesting thing is from now to 2025, we have 18 years. If we start this yes yet, yet now, then a newborn child will be an adult when the eHealth project has the earliest chance of amortizing itself. And I bet most of these children will benefit society, and the minimum we will achieve with this is we will have well above 90% computer literacy, which will close the digital gap, and we will get a lot of people which will have more skills in science and in technology. And actually, I expect that is, of course, hypothesis. Yeah? We can, you can dispute this. But I expect a flood of innovation, and I expect much better suggestions for e-health solutions, just because we have much more competent heads thinking about this. So hacking is a skill, like handling a knife. Yeah? You can use a knife to prepare a soup by shopping vegetables. You can use a knife for medical surgery. You can use a knife for self-defense. And of course, you can use a knife for murder. The latter is a crime which has to be punished. The first three uses are acceptable or even beneficial. And that is something we have to keep in mind in general public dis uh, discussion. Yeah? The skill of hacking, the skill, not the doing, the skill of hacking is neutral by itself. It depends how it's used. The next important thing, in my opinion, is security is an important quality dimension of IT sy systems. And you need a quality assurance, and for this you need persons with the appropriate skills. And I use the term hackers. And actually, these skills would do help us in design, development, and operations of system too. And the more we depend on um, critical systems as a society, the more we need an independent security assurance of this system. We can't leave this to the vendors. And finally, if we want to be a high-tech de democracy, we need citizens which are able to have a qualified opinion. Otherwise, democracy can't work anymore because democracy means that the general public is influencing decisions. And when most decisions are about high-tech and the general public 
is in majority not in the position to have an informed in opinion about this. I think we are having a problem. And so the final question is, do we want to invest in high-tech human resources or into high-tech ruins? Now we can yeah. enter spelling. I have uh, just a comment that I guess. Wait a second, please. Uh, add the, you may have to do the microphone, so everybody will listen to it. There's a very recurring pattern in IT security in that commercial um, companies making software tends to be yeah tends to be um, incompetent and lazy whenever they can. That's I mean history of IT is full of it. So for me, you can have as many competent as you can until your law and regulation doesn't make the companies do the things right in the first place, you will never get anywhere. E-Health is a good example. E-voting is a very mm -hmm. good example at, at, at the same. So we had, we had that in France, and I'm totally horrified by this. We don't have even the certification of machines that it's just crazy. Because in the first place, there's no law that says, well, you want to sell a voting machine, then you have to pass a certain number of certification. So if you don't have to do it, then you're just lazy. You do, you do your stuff, minimum size, and, and that's it. And you can have as many people as you want who say, this machine is crap and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's authorized. You have an agreement, and you can do it. So. Um, all this hacking thing is very true, and I totally agree with you, and we have the barely same law in France about hacking tools for two years or something. Um, but still, uh, we have crap e-health uh, project as well, e-voting stuff, we have plenty of them, because there's no political decision about um, enforcing liability of software vendors, mm -hmm. about constraining them into doing the things right. And I'm working for an um, um, aeronautic company, and we have this kind of regulation. And I can tell you, we can produce software with less than 10 minus 9 probability of failure. So if we can do it, I mean, others can do it, but we have to put the political will in it, and that's for me what's like the most in the uh, IT world today. Yes. Not the skills. Yes. I completely agree with you. One thing I'm concerned with, um, security assertion, security targets, definition, and so on. And what I realize, being from a manufacturer doing big projects and not small ones, it's maybe not that easy to get your security targets right and your security assertions right. There is not a whole lot of good work done on that. If we're looking at, let's say, the common criteria and how you would try to get, let's say, level five, level six. There isn't, for some of the problems, there isn't even the maths to do it. So I would say there is a lot of carelessness around. That's true, but there is still a lot of work to be done to actually get there. So maybe in the meantime, you will have to do some compromises on the level of quality assurance and which is part of security <coughs> assurance um, and just as a remark if the system you're talking about which I actually don't know um, is really as flawed as you say then it will not be a means of manipulating a lot of people because it will break apart yeah 
I suspect this too, yeah. But um, I, I also agree with uh, everything what you say, what, but I would draw conclusions from this. If at the moment we are not capable of reliable, re, uh, reliable establish a high level of security, then we should stay away from high risk applications like e-health. Yeah. That's, in my opinion, not doing so would be gross negligence. It's very, it's very, very similar to um, atomic energy, in a sense, because um, it's not a technical question. Yeah, if, for example, just using some numbers which could be disputed, if, for example, you say the um, super GAU in an um, atomic um, power plant happens once in 10 million years, that is very, very rare. The impact is massive. You will have in Germany around 20 million deaths and injured. So you can calculate from this that per atomic power plant, you have per year on the average one to two deaths. This sounds acceptable. And now it's a political or societal uh, discussion. On what do you concentrate? Do you concentrate on the average, which is low? We have much higher death rates from um, general traffic or from uh, smoking. Or do you say, no, the event, the, invent, uh, the event as such cannot be accepted? Because if this event would ever happen, it would completely change our society. Because in case of the atomic energy, we have to fend in the people contaminated and let them die. Because if, they, if we let them out, they will damage more people. Yeah? And that is a point where we uh, don't have to, where we can't um, have a technical discussion, a, a technical decision. That's a decision on a different level. And I want to open actually with this talk the perspective for this different layer where this decision has to be taken. As, uh, te as technicians, we can show technical risks, we can show ways to control these risks to a certain confident level, but we have to communicate this clearly and fairly, that is, without um, manipulation, to the general society so that we can have a dem democratic decision. And atomic energy, again, is a very good example because it shows what ha happens if you don't get a broad democratic support for your decision. And personally, I don't want to see something like this happen in computers. Yes. One remark to this. Um, the comparison, in my opinion, is not quite correct because um, atomic theory is something where when you have a certain kind of radiation and so on, this is what happens. You mm -hmm. can't control it, it just happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a problem, then that problem lasts as long as the hybrid set is, mm -hmm. and so on. So this is yeah. mainly your problem. Um, so the main decision is, will I risk the complete extinction of a certain place because I will never be able to control the technology? Because once it happens, it happens, and then you can't do anything about it. In computer science, usually, you can do something like a rollback. But so, not, not with data disclosure, and especially not with data disclosure in e-health. Yes, because e-health data, e data, e data damages for generations. That is the important thing, where actually it's very similar to atomic energy. So if someone puts it up on the torrent site. Pardon? If someone gets all the data and puts it up on the torrent site, it's kind of uh, For example. Um, 
Yes, but you can find ways to get this out of the system again. You no. can never get... Uh, no. Across the world, you can't roll that back. Uh, let me just please remind you that anything you say that doesn't go through the microphone is not recorded. Okay. So, for later on, it doesn't make sense. So, please take it as turn. Yeah, I was, I was just saying that as soon as someone has compromised the data, they've stolen the database and put it onto uTorrent or someone and everyone starts downloading it, you can't wipe that data now. It's, it's out in the public domain. We should, unfortunately, I have to interrupt us for the official break. But I hope that you shall be continuing to talk to each other. And uh, you have the opportunity tonight, maybe at the Meta Lab. So please do take the opportunity. And of course, don't forget about chatting and email and all these things that we have at our disposal. So there's a short break now. Thomas, thank you very much for your talk. <laughs>